Is a Halloween book list complete without Camille Gaiman? This is a weird little book. The Phantom is like kind of the actual worst. I screamed. <laughs> Hey guys, it's your ghost host, and I'm here today to talk about some hauntings. So I've got 10 books to talk about today, and all of them have either a ghost or a haunting or both. I'm a little kind of maybe sort of cheating on this because of the maybe it's a ghost, maybe it's a haunting. And you'll see when we get to like the ones that I'm like, that's a little bit stretching it, but Regardless, all the books I'm going to talk about today are books that I generally recommend. So even if you feel like it's a bit of a stretch to put them on a list of ghosts and hauntings, it's still a good book. So it's still worthy of attention and a mention. These are in no particular order. They are not from most spooky to least spooky or from least fitting the prompt to most fitting the prompt. They're just the order, honestly, of size, like so that my stack wouldn't topple. So that is the rhyme and reason for the order. So without further ado, let us get to the books. First on, on my list is The Woman in Black by Susan Hill. This little book packs quite a punch. And on a related note, if you ever have the opportunity to see the stage play that is based on the book, highly recommend. I mean, I can't guarantee that the production that you'll see is good, you know, because all depends on the particular director and the cast and etc. But I saw it on stage a few years ago now, and it was so scary. I screamed in the theater. And this is not a cinema. This is like a, a fancy paying many monies for your ticket type theater. And I screamed. <laughs> but anyway, The Woman in Black is a very short little gothic spooky ghost story that is all told from the perspective of the person who experienced this. He's telling it like on Christmas Eve, telling this thing that happened to him, this ghost story. And so he is, <laughs> I guess kind of similar premise to Dracula, right? Cause he's a lawyer and he's gone now to this place this really remote place to sort out the papers of this of the deceased um because you know the estate papers etc so he goes to this remote house which is being haunted by the woman in black so this house is isolated not just because it's in the countryside um the place it's like the locale it's in is already very remote but also the house itself is even more isolated because it can only be accessed by this causeway that gets flooded when the, the tide comes in at night. So during the day you can get to and from where this house is, but at night you cannot get across. So you're just stuck there at night. So he's there by himself going through these old papers from this from the deceased. And of course the house is haunted. And oh my gosh, it is so spooky and atmospheric. I mean, the book is too. It's it's genuinely chilling. And I feel like it really does a good job setting the scene and, and putting you in this situation where you feel the kind of dread and isolation that he would feel. And the stage play, at least the staging of it I saw, there's like a whole part of the play where they turn out all the lights. Like the only lights visible in the house are like the exit signs, but it is pitch dark, not just on the stage, not just in the house, the whole, all of it, pitch dark. And the only light that is used is him lighting matches. Oh my God. It was so scary. <laughs> anyway, um, I recommend the book. I do not recommend the film. The film was terrible. But the book and the play, very, very good. Very creepy. Next up is already the book that is the most um, stretching it, but whatever. Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. This book, I would argue, is a haunting. Um, if you don't know the story of Rebecca, the titular eponymous Rebecca herself is deceased and the book is named after her. So there you go. Already, this is a ghost story because the lady on the, the title, She's dead. So <laughs> our main character who's an unnamed narrator, she's this young ingenue and she meets this very wealthy man who's considerably older um, while she's in Monte Carlo. And he falls in love with her and marries her and takes her back to his house, Manderley. And this house is like a grand old estate. He is very wealthy. This is a famous old house. She's just this young girl who's not very rich at all, doesn't really know how to manage a house. And she is his second wife. His first wife was Rebecca. And Rebecca is all over the house. She's left her mark. Everyone remembers Rebecca. The only person who's never met Rebecca has no idea what Rebecca was like is the narrator. So she already feels like she's sort of, you know, wrong footed because she sort of has to step into the shoes of this deceased woman. She has no idea what her now husband's relationship was like with his wife. Was it good? Was it bad? Was it neutral? Um, she's, Rebecca was clearly left her mark. Whether people liked her or hated her, she seems to have been a formidable person who people had opinions about. Her monogrammed R's on everything in the house. Everyone 
all the servants are accustomed to how Rebecca used to do things. So it's just this specter of Rebecca that is haunting Manderley and is haunting our narrator in not quite a literal sense, but in every other sense. So, which is kind of the point of the story is, I mean, that's, that's why her name's on the cover. Because even though she is dead, even though the main character is somebody else, the main character is Rebecca. So I would certainly say that this counts as a haunting. Next up I have The Phantom of the Opera. This is unpopular opinion because it's the book, not the musical. The musical is well loved and it's like the longest running show on Broadway, etc, etc. And I love the musical, don't get me wrong, I do. But few people have read the book and even fewer of those people like the book. I've read the book like three or four times. I read it a lot when I was in high school. I really, really like it. This is a classic. Um, it was written in, originally in French, so this is translated from French. And it is much more of a dark, sinister story than the musical. The musical is kind of unapologetically romanticizing a pretty toxic and horrifying situation. The Phantom of the Opera is a, a crazy serial killer who is disfigured and, and a squatter. <laughs> in the opera house. There's, I mean, on paper, the Phantom is like, like kind of the actual worst. So the, the fact that you come away from the musical kind of emotionally invested in the Phantom is a testament to Andrew Lloyd Webber's musical writing, music writing skills. But the Phantom of the Opera, the original story that that musical is based on, which Andrew Lloyd Webber doesn't actually like the book. He kind of hates the book, which is, I don't know, that's this whole other thing. Like, why'd you write a musical based on a book you hated, sir? The, the original story is a lot more of a, of a gothic, monster mystery not well not really mystery because you do know what's going on but um yeah it's much of a, more of a, of a gothic tale um so i mean the the plot does largely the musical if you've seen it the, it isn't diverged too much in terms of the broad strokes it does follow the book pretty much exactly it is more in the details and more in the nuance of the various situations the nuance of the character dynamics that is different and it is very different for one the phantom even though the cover of this book has gone with the musical version of the mask, the phantom in the book, his whole head is like a death's head. Like he looks like um, like Jack Skellington, only ugly. There, no little half mask is gonna do the trick. Like his his whole head is stuff of nightmares. They mention, they pay lip service to this in the musical, they do, but they don't really elaborate on that other than to use it as a, a plot convenience to sort of explain away anything he's able to do. Um, but he is a genius, a sort of engineering technological genius, because before he ever came to the opera house, he was, um, he did work for is it a, a shah or a prince or something, constructing elaborate uh, amusements, I guess. Um, so the fact that he's able to haunt the opera house is a testament to his technical skill, that he is able to construct elaborate things that make it seem like it's a haunting or enable him to move about to the opera house undetected because he's figured out you know, a sequence of trap doors and behind the scenes, whatever. So there's a lot more to his, it's basically he's a torture genius, that he looks like the stuff of monsters or the stuff of nightmares, but he is like a prodigy. And so when you combine this incredible intelligence with being treated like a monster, well, then he's going to use the gifts that he has, i.e. his mind, against the world, which has treated him like a monster. You treat me like a monster? Fine, then I'll be the monster that you treated me as. He is obsessed with Christine Daae. That's the same as the musical. He is also, um, you know, into music. <laughs> it's not just building stuff. You know, that that's all a thing. <laughs> so, like, again, he does give her lessons. He's obsessed with her. She is a, a ballerina singer in the opera house. Her father was a Swedish violinist, which again, they briefly mention in the musical, but it's kind of a bigger part of the book, like her childhood with her father, the violinist, how she knew Raoul when they were children, and what it's like being sort of kidnapped by the Phantom. It's a, just a lot more sinister and a lot more sort of grappling with the Phantom and why he is the way that he is and and what he's actually doing. It's not glossed over in an elaborate musical number where I guess there's some trap doors and some gizmos. It really kind of goes into like everything he's able to do and how genius it is, but also kind of like horrific because he is able to basically elaborately torture people by bewildering them in like the phantasm of his creations. So like it takes a genius to do this, but also like that's kind of sick that you're putting people through this. So I love the book and I would definitely say The Phantom is haunting the opera house. Next up I have 
The Unsuitable by Molly Pollack. This I read for the first time last year and I liked this a lot more than I expected to. I mean, I expected to like it. That's why I bought it. But this is a weird little book. I don't know if I can like universally recommend it. It is, it is a strange book. It's kind of like if you took like Oscar Wilde or like the importance of being earnest and that sort of that tone of sort of social commentary and social comedy and comedy of manners and um, mixed it with like, I don't know, what's really horrifying? Because <laughs> it, it, it is, it's kind of really scary or not scary, but like the, the haunting aspects of it are kind of gnarly. Big, big trigger warnings for self-harm because there is a great deal of self-harm in this book, like a lot. It's kind of the entire plot. It is not a, it is not a bug, it is a feature. It is literally the plot. So if you have, if you don't want to engage with a book that deals with self-harm, do not read this. But so in essence, this story follows a young woman who when she was born, her collarbone is broken as she was being born. And this, I forget if that's the thing that killed her mother or it was sort of all part and parcel, but basically her mother died giving birth to her. And she has this huge scar from when her collarbone was broken as a baby. And our main character, I, this either is happening or she believes that this is happening, that her dead mother's ghost, spirit, soul is in this, in like the scar tissue of this huge unsightly scar that she has, like all of the, cause like it, it's not just like a mark, like this is all kind of like crunched and smooshed and there's like lumps of like scar tissue flesh that healed weirdly. So like she always wears really high collars. This is taking place like Victorian era-ish. So she wears like really high necked dresses to hide that. But there's like all of this like ness from when she was born and she broke her collarbone. So she hears her mother's voice and her mother has some very interesting ideas and she won't leave her daughter alone. Her daughter really has no interest in getting married and who would want to get married to somebody who's crazy? So she kind of doesn't mind hiding that she's crazy because she doesn't want to get married to any of the guys that her dad wants her to get married to. Her dad is not a swell fellow. But when she does want her mom to leave her alone, she physically attacks her own scar because that, again, either really does shut up her mom's ghost or at least in the mind of this young woman that shuts up the voice of her mom, which is in her mind. Now, there are things that mom's voice tells her that it seems difficult to explain how the young woman would know these things independently in order to, if like, if this voice was only in her head, if she's imagining, if she's schizophrenic. Like the mom's voice tells her things that is like new information that she would have no other way of knowing. So anyway, th it ends in a, <laughs> I didn't know how this was going to go, where it was going to go, and I, I didn't expect the ending when, I, when it came to that. But along the way, you know, because she's trying to be paired off, like her father's trying to pair her off with dudes that she doesn't have any interest in marrying. So there's sort of this like comedy of manners that feels very like Oscar Wilde-ish, except for the like dead mom's ghost that's in her scar is also a factor. <laughs> so it's just like a very strange little book. And it was just so unlike anything I've ever read. And it was, you know, genuinely kind of horrifying at times because of, you know, because of the self-harm and because of just generally things going on in this household and what her father is like, having to just like live like that. It was kind of horrifying, but it was also very funny at times because of the banter that was this comedy of manners. So I guarantee you, if you read it, you've never read anything like it. <laughs> and I, I really enjoyed it. I really did. And it's not terribly long, so give it a go, maybe. Next up I have, the Graveyard Book by Neil Gaiman. It's a Halloween book list complete without Neil Gaiman. So if you don't know anything about The Graveyard Book, this is a middle grade book. This is also, if, it's either my second favorite or it's tied for first of all Neil Gaiman's books. That being my first or equal being Ocean at the End of the Lane. The Graveyard Book, again, is a middle grade book and it is Neil Gaiman's retelling of The Jungle Book by Rudyard Kipling. But instead of a jungle, we are in a graveyard. Instead of jungle animals, we have ghosts and ghouls and goblins and this sort of thing. Actually, no goblins. Ghosts and ghouls and things like that of that nature that are raising a young boy who lives in the graveyard the way that Mowgli lives in a jungle. So it's a lot more sinister, but it is sweet and funny as well because it is a middle grade book, but it is a middle grade book by Neil Gaiman who does not like to pull his punches even when it is for children. Our main character, his parents are brutally murdered. <laughs> That's where we open. And as he is escaping the his parents' murderer, he winds up in the graveyard. And there the ghosts and other things of the night that inhabit the graveyard, they 
they protect the boy and hide him from this killer and then the boy has nowhere else to go so they take on the responsibility of raising him. So he grows up being parented and tutored and taught life lessons, life skills, the birds and the bees by, by ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> by ghosts and um, his his main caretaker mentor who is decidedly not a ghost but is also a dead thing. It is a charming book. I did not expect to feel such feelings reading it. It's Neil Gaiman so I expected to love it and it was praised pretty much the moment it was published as being like well Gaiman did it again this is great but I didn't expect to cry at the end of the graveyard book and I absolutely did um, so I highly recommend it. It is an absolutely charming story the nods to the it, the original Jungle Book are interesting. If you sort of try to figure out who might be the kind of parallels to the individual animals from the Jungle Book. And this is again, much more chilling. And honestly, like the, the antagonist, the Shere Khan type character, I suppose, is genuinely kind of terrifying. Like the way I talk about Coraline, like Graveyard Book overall is less scary than Coraline because it's really only that part of it that is. But that part of it is like, kind of low-key scary, even as an adult. So, uh, you know, it's Gaiman, so you know what you're getting. Um, and it is an absolutely fantastic little book. I highly recommend. Next up, I have The Hazelwood by Melissa Albert. Now, it's been a minute since I read this, so it's a little bit fuzzy. I would like to read it again because I did like it and I haven't read the sequel yet because of that, that I read this too long ago and I would need to reread it before reading the sequel. In essence, <laughs> the main character of this book, her grandmother, yes wrote a book called The Hazelwood and it is like a completely out of print and is missing cannot be found but has like a cult following for those that were able to read it and this girl starts being followed and haunted and pursued by things that were from the grandmother's book. Did I say it was called The Hazelwood because it was not called The Hazelwood it was called Tales from the Hinterland but The Hazelwood is the home where her grandmother lived lives in any event yeah this girl is being haunted by imaginary things and people from this missing cult following book written by her grandmother. And of course she goes to the Hazelwood, this house, and very haunting, spooky things occur at the house. <laughs> That's both all I can say and largely what I can remember about what happens in the Hazelwood. I mean, I do remember more specifics, but they're spoilery specifics. <laughs> but yeah, uh, again, as far as why it belongs on this list, I think that is clear. I did really like it and the, I gave it the highest praise really that I can give a book and that is that I found it to be incredibly Gaiman-esque. I would recommend. Next up I have, on the lighter side, My Plain Jane by Cynthia Hand, Brody Ashton, and Jodie Meadows. This is the only one in the series that I've read. They wrote three books about various Janes and now they've moved on and they're applying their skills to various Marys. I own all of them all of the Jane books and all of the, and the first of the Mary books. This is the only one I've read. So it's on the, on the basis of liking this and I've got all the other ones. But so My Plain Jane is taking the story of Jane Eyre, but sort of telling it with Charlotte Bronte in it, where they're like friends, Jane Eyre and Charlotte Bronte. And it's basically like Jane Eyre meets the Ghostbusters. <laughs> and it's meant to be lighthearted. It's not meant to be taken seriously, which is why it could get away with doing a lot of stupid things that are very sort of campy and it leans into being campy. It absolutely knows what it is. It's not trying to be a very serious Jane Eyre retelling. And it's not trying to act like there are intense stakes and this is the story of high drama. It's meant to be a fun romp with ghosts with lots and lots of winks and nods to the original Jane Eyre as well as to the life um, of Charlotte Bronte and to just the Bronte books in general as well as nods to the Ghostbusters and just being a fun little story in its own right with lots of ghosts <laughs> uh, because basically like this this universe's version of the Ghostbusters is kind of the society and they're recruiting I forget now if it's Jane or Charlotte but one of the two of them is like real good at seeing ghosts you know Sixth Sense style and they're, they really need this skill on the payroll, so to speak. So um, they're trying to recruit her. That's why she goes to Thornfield Hall. It's a uh, part of her mission. Anyway, yeah. So if you like a fun story, if you like something that's inspired by a classic, while sort of reverently poking fun at it and having a good time, then I recommend this book. I think it's quite 
fun and clever for what it is. Next up I have House of Salt and Sorrows by Erin A. Craig. I feel like I've been talking about this book a lot recently where I just like didn't talk about it at all and all of a sudden now just a whole bunch. <laughs> but anyway House of Salt and Sorrows is a retelling of the 12 Dancing Princesses which I have not seen anyone else retell at all so it's just refreshing to have something retold that isn't Cinderella or Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> when it came out the cover was certainly intriguing but I neither expected to like it as much as I did nor did I expect it to be as spooky eerie and atmospheric as it was. So in general I thought it was an excellent debut. I just thought it was a good book that I had a good time with and was miles and way better than a lot of other new releases I was reading at the time or that I've read since. But moreover I was surprised by how chilling and atmospheric it was at times. There were multiple times when I was felt it was genuinely eerie because it's very much the sort of like seaside ghosts kind of atmosphere and the the 12 dancing princesses storyline kind of becomes quite sinister and I, I have to say I didn't love the ending it does have sort of a shoehorned in romance that kind of almost I mean I have no idea if this is true but it sort of feels to me like the author might have been pressured into putting it in there because it, it doesn't really feel like it belongs with the rest but the rest I thought was most excellent very engaging again quite chilling and atmospheric and it is very ghosty haunty seaside thing so absolutely deserves to be on this list. Next up I have Jacoby by William Ritter. This is the first book in a series. I am currently in the middle of that series closing close to the end and I do so far at least the first book has been my favorite and the most charming and the most it that it is. The thing that Jacoby is the first book is the most. <laughs> so what it is is Jacoby himself the character he is basically like if you threw together in a blender Doctor Who, Sherlock from the new adaptation, like the, the from Sherlock, not from Sherlock Holmes. But I actually know a bit of Sherlock Holmes as well, if we're honest. Just okay, just any iteration of Sherlock Holmes with Doctor Who, but made it ghosts. <laughs> so he's not an alien, he, but he's able to engage with the supernatural. And he behaves a great deal like an amalgam of the Doctor and Sherlock Holmes. Because he's a sort of a, a eccentric detective who's a little, who says things that you don't necessarily know what he's talking about, but he knows what he's talking about. Which I mean the Doctor does, as does Sherlock Holmes. But he's sort of got a more youthful quirky energy which the Doctor tends to have and all of the sort of weird unnatural unexplainable phenomena is more in line with like what the Doctor tends to be dealing with rather than what Sherlock Holmes tends to be dealing with and it's just a great time. I absolutely devoured it. It's just fun. The characters are fun and very memorable. The plot is engaging and it's a uh, it's a great spooky haunting read because I mean if I didn't say largely the supernatural that he's dealing with is um ghosts and things so yeah Jacoby last but not least I have Ninth House by Lee Bardugo this is again one where do check out content warnings and if basically anything is gonna bother you then don't read this because it has just about every trigger I could think of it's not for the faint of heart um, but so basically this is based on actually Lee Bardugo's own year spent in Yale which is where she got her degree. Yale does really have secret societies but so Lee Bardugo has written a Yale where the secret societies are really just very uh, various forms of necromantic ability. Is, ne is it necromancy? I think it's necromancy. And our main character in Ninth House is you guessed it in the Ninth House. <laughs> and so she uh, she sees a lot of dead people. That's kind of her thing. This is not spoilers. This is not a revelation on page one, our main character sees dead people. So yeah, I don't think I need to explain why it belongs on a list of ghosts and hauntings. Um, this is basically dark academia, but with that sort of like magical haunting ghostly twist. And it has, again, just about every trigger that I can possibly think of in it. So it's not a light read, but it is certainly a haunting one. Yeah. So that does it for my list. Let me know in the comments down below if you have read any of the books on my list, if you now plan to read any of the books on my list, if you will never ever read any of the books on my list, if you have already read all of them and you think they're all terrible, so you think this is a terrible list, whatever you want to let me know. I post videos on Saturdays, other random times as well, but definitely Saturdays, so like and subscribe. Join my Patreon if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you when I see you.